Okay, let's continue our discussion of skin, the integumentary system, uh, in chapter five of our human anatomy and physiology text. Uh, this is part three in which we'll discuss another appendage of the skin, the nails, as well as uh, skin cancer and burns. <clears throat> nails can be thought of as uh, having a lot in common with hairs. Um, they are a structure comprising dead keratinocytes, but full of a very hard type of keratin, a different keratin protein than found in the epidermis. Um, the nail matrix is analogous to the hair matrix. It's the growing portion, the place where the cells are dividing to produce all of the, the cells that will give rise to the nail itself. Let's just skip over those words because they just um, tell in, in word form what's in this cartoon diagram. Um, <clears throat> here you can see the very familiar appearance of the nail on a, on a digit. Uh, and <clears throat> here is the nail matrix where the hairs are, where the cells are growing, I'm sorry, and producing the structure, which is then forced distally as it, as it grows. And so the stem cells and transit amplifying cells, excuse me, are here in the nail matrix. We have a nail bed, which is an adaptation of the epidermis, the, the epithelium that uh, attaches the nail uh, firmly to the distal phalanx as it uh, pushes out distally. The hyponychium, the tissue just <coughs> proximal to the open, the um, free end of the nail. The eponychium, a little uh, layer of tissue just distal to the to the hair matrix or the nail matrix. I'm sorry. Uh, you can see familiar pattern on the on the on the uh, proximal part of the nail. <coughs> so nails. Um, an appendage of the skin are important for protection of the tip of the finger, allow us to have a lot of uh, capability in terms of manipulating small objects and so forth in our environment. But they also can be used diagnostically for identifying nutritional and disease conditions. <coughs> Excuse me. A yellow tinged nail may indicate something wrong with the respiratory system or with the thyroid gland, hypothyroid. Um, Fungal infections will also cause the nails to, to have a yellow appearance and also look thickened and kind of rough on the surface. A concave surface instead of convex surface of a nail, coilonychia, uh, is suggestive of an iron deficiency. Um, Bose lines in nails um, are possibly the result of some interference or interruption in the growth of the, of the nail matrix. Uh, such as uh, after a heart attack, a severe disease, a, a, a cancer treatment, um, diabetes. And here's a little illustration of that that con that concavity instead of having that dome-shaped nail of coilonychia and Bose lines, an interruption of the of the nail um, because of some event. Sometimes, if there's a periodic treatment, say with cancer chemotherapy, there may be a row of these indentations or white lines in the nail. <clears throat> Sweat glands are another appendage of the skin. They're called sudoriferous glands. They're found on uh, in the in the skin on most parts of the body. Um, there's two main types of, of sweat glands. Eccrine sweat glands are the glands that produce a watery secretion that's important in uh, evaporative heat loss from the body. And apocrine sweat glands are found in the in the uh, axillary and anogenital regions and become active in puberty. Uh, glands, interestingly, contain myoepithelial cells that can help actually pump the, the secretion out into the ducts to improve the delivery of the product onto the surface of the body. <clears throat> so, eccrine sweat glands have American merocrine secretion mechanism that we talked about in chapter way back in chapter one, I believe, and they're important in thermal regulation. As water molecules evaporate from the surface of the body, they take heat with them, energy away from the body, the heat of vaporization, it's called, um, uh, that helps cool the body. It's the most important uh, form of, of heat loss during exercise, especially in a hot environment. It's mainly water. There are some salts in it, uh, as well as some other substances, antibodies, defensive um, proteins of the immune system. Dermcidin is an antimicrobial peptide that's, that's added to the sweat by the, by the, um, the simple cuboidal epithelial cells there in the, in the sweat glands. There are also some metabolic wastes that can be identified in the skin. Here's a 
that familiar cartoon of the skin in a micrograph, H&E stained micrograph of thin section of, of skin showing an ectin sweat gland. And there, it's like a tubular arrangement of simple cuboidal epithelial cells, secretory cells, that are then raveled up into like a ball of spaghetti. And, uh, and so when you cut through, you see uh, circles and ovals and every which kind of, of um, shape that's produced by all the random angles through which we cut these uh, sort of tubes, secretory tubules. So anyway, you can see the duct that forms here that carries the sweat then to the surface of the body for evaporation. These are generally found deep in the dermis, in the reticular dermis, <clears throat> a little less deep in the scalp, scalp skin, because there's so many hair follicles presumably packed in there. But <clears throat> apocrine sweat glands, again, are, are found in the axillary and anogenital region. They produce a much richer secretion than the watery sweat of the eccrine sweat glands, and consequently, um, that produces a, a nutritious um, media for the growth of various bacteria, which then leads to the familiar uh, body odor that accumulates if we uh, don't wash off the, the, uh, the product. And it's interesting that in our culture, we're so uh, concerned about the uh, presence of body odor, whereas in many other cultures, uh, it's not considered a, a detriment at all. And, and there, possibly because there's been the option for shower, daily showering or multiple daily showering is not uh, available to people. And so they have just been perfectly happy to live with uh, the normal uh, bacterial colonization. <clears throat> other modified sweat glands, other than apocrine sweat glands, modified apocrine sweat glands include ceruminous glands, which produce a kind of an orangish waxy secretion in the ear canals, the uh, external auditory meatus, and, and so earwax is a familiar product there, and that keeps um, debris and, and bugs and things out of the ear canal so that we don't interrupt the, the movement of air or of um, sound waves through there. The mammary glands are also modified apocrine sweat glands that secrete the milk for, um, for uh, nutrition of infants. <clears throat> Sebaceous glands, that's another appendage of the, of the skin. Sebaceous glands produce an antimicrobial um, oily substance that, that helps prevent bacterial colonization of our skin and follicles. It also lubricates and softens the skin and the follicles. Uh, they become especially more active at puberty and, and hence the, the presence of pimples on the skin. Um, sebum <clears throat> enters into the superficial most part of the hair follicle and then uh, travels from, from the sebaceous gland onto the surface of the skin. Holocrine secretion in which the the um, superficial most um, secretory cells just erupt and, and just disintegrate as the, as the sebum product then is released into the follicle as a mode of secretion. <clears throat> so here's a characteristic look of a sebaceous gland uh, in the histological section. Here we can see the car our familiar cartoon of, this, of the hair follicle with with sebaceous glands associated with the superficial most part of the follicle. And here we see these, um, these cells that have essentially gathered in very little stain, so they look quite clear with a small punctate nucleus uh, with a surrounding kind of a capsule there. That's the look of a, of a sebaceous gland in histological section. Here you can see the hair follicle and part of the region wherein the, the hair was forming, the hair shaft was forming initially. So, um, again, during adolescence, during puberty, um, excess secretion of, of sebum, as well as a very fast rate of, of epithelial growth on the skin, causes sometimes clogging of the pores and the accumulation of sebum in the pores, uh, which causes what's called a whitehead. And then uh, they can often become infected, which leads to inflammation and reddening and, and discomfort and pus forming their neutrophils coming into the area to fight against the bacteria and forming pus, a mixture of dead bacteria and dead white blood cells and so forth, um, clotted blood. Um, <clears throat> another thing, interesting thing that may happen is um, the, the skin may be colonized by fungus. So the epidermis, and especially in, in infants, uh, may be especially uh, susceptible to colonization by malassezia fungi and causing a uh, 
uh, seborrhea, it's called an inflammation and combination of inflammation and, and, uh, and fungus infection that causes this characteristic look of, of infants, oftentimes called cradle path. <clears throat> um, the skin is, especially the dermis, we've said several times already in the study, how important is that, that in order to maintain our body temperature, we need to dissipate every joule of heat that's produced by cellular metabolism, by muscle contraction, and so forth. And, um, and the way we can do that is to change or control the rate is by changing the, the heat, the temperature gradient or heat gradient uh, in the skin. <clears throat> the steeper the heat gradient, the faster heat will be lost from the surface of the body. So when the body is hot, it will cause vasodilation in the dermis, and that will create a steeper heat gradient, and then heat will flow from the from all through the dermis to the surface, and then be lost from the surface, especially in the context of sweating, perspiration, and the sweat glands will be activated by the sympathetic nervous system when the body temperature rises under control of the hypothalamus, and, um, and then we'll have evaporative heat loss, and we can deliver more of that energy to the surface for that process by, again, vasodilating those excess vessels, those looping vessels in the dermis of the skin. If the body temperature begins to fall or we're exposing ourselves to a cold external environment, the hypothalamus temperature sensor source of information will tell it, yes, we're out in the cold and or the body temperature is falling, and the hypothalamus will uh, initiate uh, constriction of the blood vessels in the skin, and that will reduce the steepness of the heat gradient, pull that warm blood away from the surface beneath the hypodermis layer of insulating fat, and will slow the loss of heat from the surface of the body, and hence we'll be able to maintain some heat in the body and raise the temperature back up. <clears throat> there are sensory receptors, as we have said, again, a number of times already in the, in the dermis and even in the epidermis, um, free nerve endings in the, in the papillary dermis, uh, transduce uh, stimuli such as pain stimuli, temperature changes, and itch uh, causing sensations. The simian corpuscles are these layered onion-like structures in the deep uh, reticular dermis that sense deep stretch and vibration. Merkel discs in the basal layer of the epidermis in conjunction with modified um, um, dendrites of neurons in the, in the dermis um, form sensitive touch receptors. Um, <clears throat> there's also as we said before, there are other um, sensory receptors called Meisner's corpuscles uh, that are uh, a type of, of encapsulated uh, dendrite structure in the dermis that uh, is another sensitive receptor for touch. And so here's our familiar cartoon. You can see three nerve endings, Pacinian corpuscles, and uh, glad to be reminded to mention something about hair follicle receptors, just free nerve endings uh, of dendrites that are wrapped around the bulb of a hair follicle, so the slightest perturbation of a hair will cause movement of the hair follicle and sensation. <clears throat> Metabolic functions of the skin, uh, the most important one that I think we should mention is the, is the presence of or the activation of, of cholesterol to, to initiate vitamin D synthesis. We need to be able to absorb calcium from our diet to maintain bone density, calcium phosphate Hydroxyapatite in the ground substance of bone is what gives it a stiffness and hardness, and we need to maintain that uh, something that we tend to lose with age anyway, and so we want to make sure we have plenty of vitamin D in the form of the body or taken as a supplement. Um, <clears throat> blood, as we said, the skin can act as a blood reservoir. There are so many extra blood vessels in the dermis that uh, if we look and see how much volume of the blood exists in the skin at any moment as it's flowing through, uh, it's quite a significant percentage of the blood, so uh, if we constrict those vessels under conditions where we need to increase blood volume, we can get some of that volume out of the skin and back into the general circulation. Excretion. Um, you can find urea and other nitrogenous wastes in the, in the sweat, and so um, in some quarters it's considered to be a, a mode of excretion. I think it's actually probably more likely just uh, a coincidental event um, that the, the, the body's regulation of these nitrogenous wastes is through the kidneys uh, and, and the concentration of those substances in the urine. Uh, I think one reason this is uh, highlighted is because in certain uh, situations where the kidneys are failing, there will be a large increase in the amount of nitrogenous waste in the sweat. 
almost like a homeostatic emergency backup mechanism for getting rid of this waste. But I can tell you, in the absence of, of uh, either a kidney transplant or kidney dialysis, it won't suffice and, and a fatal outcome will ensue. <clears throat> Skin cancer. Let's talk about that, and then we'll talk about, about burns. Uh, in addition, many uh, viral infections and other types of ailments reveal themselves in various types of rashes and changes in the appearance of the skin, so there is a lot of diagnostic value in dermatological analysis, but we will go on and talk about those other fairly drastic situations, uh, skin cancers and burns. So UV radiation, ultraviolet light, has enough energy to actually chemically modify the DNA in the, in the, in the cells of the, of the epidermis of the skin, and if, if the right combination of uh, mutations occurs by random action of the UV light, we may have transformation of normal dividing keratinocytes in the basal layer of the skin into, uh, into tumor cells or possibly in the, in the uh, spinous layer. Tumor cells uh, are cells that just grow unchecked without the requirement for a normal signal to grow and, the, and generally tumor cells do not perform any of the normal functions of the type of cell from which they arose. Uh, so that's, that's what we call cancer. Um, so let's talk about quickly about three sort of types of skin cancer, all of which arise in the epidermis. Um, basal cell carcinomas are, now these are, the first two are cancers of keratinocytes, and this probably should have been highlighted here. Basal cell meaning the cells of the epidermis, the keratinocytes. So in the least differentiated, the least mature cells give rise to tumor cells, it's called a basal cell carcinoma. And generally, this is the slowest growing of the skin cancers and the most easily removed from the body by excision, right? We very readily can spot uh, lesions on the surface of the skin, unusual um, uh, formations of like, sores on the skin that don't heal normally and so forth. And we are in a situation, most of us, where we have access to good health care and we can go to our primary care and be referred to a dermatologist and get these things taken care of. And there's a little picture of one way that a basal cell carcinoma may appear early on. May eventually form an ulcer, a sore in the middle of that kind of raised area. A squamous cell carcinoma is another type of keratinocyte cancer. Um, it, the cells in the, in the squamous cell carcinoma have the look of, of more of cells of the, of the spinous region of the spinous layer of the epidermis. So um, it's a little bit more differentiated looking cells, hence the name squamous cell carcinoma. <clears throat> now these uh, these cancers are faster growing and more likely to, instead of remaining within the epidermis, penetrate through the basement membrane down into the dermis and into the tissues beneath. Again, these are slow enough growing um, cancers that generally speaking in our society anyway, a wealthy society that we are, we can recognize these as abnormal and, and have them excised by our dermatologist um, readily and, and there's no further problems. Uh, but if, if left untreated, these cancers can penetrate deep down into the muscle and bone beneath the skin and cause all kinds of problems. Um, squamous cell carcinomas generally start out as a, as a hard, kind of scaly region of the skin and eventually progress to a, a true squamous cell carcinoma. You can see that the, the cells here are not performing their normal task and there's some ulceration happening, some um, escape of blood from the dermis out onto the surface there. Um, but again, usually these things can be excised. Melanomas are a different animal altogether. The melanocytes in the, in the basal layer of the epidermis, when transformed, again by ultraviolet light, uh, produce a very aggressive growing cell type, typically in B. So it's very important to early detect uh, melanomas so before they spread, because once they spread, they're that much harder to eradicate from the body. Progress is being made in, uh, in therapies for melanomas, but it's still a very dire situation indeed if you have a metastatic melanoma, one that in which the tumor cells have spread to other parts of the body. <clears throat> so it's important to recognize them, so we develop some strategies for scrutinizing the surface of the body, especially in people with lighter skin. Uh, the ABC D rule is a way of identifying melanomas. Well, we're, we're talking about moles, patches of, of, of densities of, of melanocytes and melanin in the skin, uh, as distinct from the surrounding regions. And if there is an asymmetry, moles tend to be round. If there's an asymmetry, uh, so that one side has a different shape than the other, 
that's a sign that their cells growing and that's inappropriate. So most typically just remain relatively static in appearance in the dimensions. The border irregular, irregularity, the border of a, of a mole should be smooth. It starts to have all kinds of, of coves and inlets. That's a sign again that some cells are growing out from the from the center of the of the structure, and that's a bad sign. Color. Typically, um, the moles on a person's body fall within a, a, a predictable range of colors, and also each mole tends to be fairly uniform itself of its own color. And um, if the color becomes kind of diverse within the structure of a the mole, then uh, and, and different relative to other moles in the body, that's a a bad sign yeah, and something should probably be done. And then finally the, the, the dimensions. If a mole becomes larger and larger and exceeds five or six millimeters in diameter, that's a sign it should probably be considered dangerous and take it off. Um, now most melanomas are radial melanomas, meaning they grow kind of horizontally under the surface of the epidermis and remain uh, within the uh, you know superficial to the basement membrane of the epidermis for a while as they grow. And again, that and they allow us to identify them by these by this ABCD rule before they begin to penetrate down into the dermis, and, and then uh, some cells begin leaving and spreading throughout the body. Um, metastasis. However, some melanomas are called nodular melanomas, and they almost immediately begin to, to dig down to grow down into the, the tissues under the epidermis, like the roots of a tree, and uh, and that's a very bad situation indeed, because very quickly before maybe we even notice them, they may start to um, metastasize or spread. So the ABCD rule won't apply here. There's instead some EFG properties that are used to identify these so-called nodular melanomas. Elevated, if moles are generally flat in the surface of the body, or, or at least uh, they may be raised, but then they remain flat like a mesa. If there's a rounded elevation in the, in the mole and, or in a, in, a, in a pigmented patch, that's a sign, a possible sign of danger. Uh, firmness. It, they tend to grow when they're hard, and, and the growth, the constant change in the dimensions is a sign that you have something bad happening there. And again, because of the fast penetrating nature of these melanomas, should be very aggressively treated. <clears throat> Here's a picture of a melanoma uh, growing in the face. Burns. If the skin is exposed to excessive heat, it causes damage to the cells in the and the extracellular matrix of the of the of the um, of the connective tissue, then we'll have what we call a burn. Some chemicals can cause burns, but oftentimes just heat causes burns. The denaturation of proteins. Proteins, uh, by the nature, by virtue of their of their their amino acid sequence, tend to fold in a very specific way and assemble into into filaments. If it's a if it's a fibrous protein, and when you when you heat the proteins beyond a certain point. They unravel and lose their normal shape. That's what we mean by denaturation, and that changes the properties of the protein. So, uh, indeed, it will change the, the properties of the dermis if we, if we heat it up too much. And it will also kill keratinocytes. <clears throat> so, once a burn occurs, um, dehydration uh, can be a big problem because the epidermis, again, is the waterproof seal on the surface of the body. And when that's interrupted, then water can escape if there's a significant amount of the surface area. Uh, you know, involved in a burn, um, loss of fluid and electrolytes is a very big concern. Also, infections. Uh, the epidermis protects us from bacteria uh, and, and fungi, and when people get a severe burn, um, oftentimes uh, the biggest concern, beyond, once we have a good IV going to, to replace volume, is infections. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, for example, infections in the plant, so it's a big problem. Um, <clears throat> one way to evaluate, quickly evaluate burns in the field in order to establish the percent of surface area involved in the burn so that we can then extrapolate from that and say, well, I wonder how much fluid is being lost from this burn and how much fluid replacement is going to be needed to treat this right off the bat. Um, we could use what's called the rule of nines. All different regions of the body are, are assigned a, a particular percent of the surface area. And it's a handy way, once you very quickly can memorize this pattern, so that, for example, the fronts and backs of the legs each represent 9% of the body surface area. The anterior and posterior of the torso each represent two, two nines, 18% of the, of the surface area. Arms front and back both represent 9% of the surface area and so forth. So if you can just memorize that, um, that characteristic amount of the surface area uh, of each part of the body, then you can quickly assess a burn and report the percentage of the surface area involved. 
and the, and the degree. We not only want to report the percentage of surface area involved, we want to report the severity of the burn in each one of the, in each region uh, and how much of the, the body may be involved. So first degree burns are confined to the epidermis. So we have hurt the keratinocytes, damaged some keratinocytes, maybe some of the layers are, are starting to um, experience some injury. Edema, swelling may be taking place. That's what happens when you have inflammation. We're going to have redness, erythema it's called. We're going to have swelling, thickening of the skin. It's going to be painful. Second degree burn involves uh, um, damage also to the papillary dermis. When that happens, we can easily have splitting away of the epidermis from the dermis. And once that happens, that creates a place where fluid escaping from the capillaries and the blood vessels of the dermis can accumulate uh, because partly because that's what blood vessels do and partly because the presence of histamine um, and with, along with the, the inflammation will cause leakiness of vessels and we'll have a blister. Mm. Third degree burns are full thickness burns. All parts of the, derm the epidermis and dermis are, are, are damaged and destroyed. Um, that's the worst kind of situation because in order to re-epithelialize, the keratinocytes need some something to walk out onto. And if we don't have any place where some, some granulation tissue can form and those, and those cells can grow in there and fibroblasts can work, uh, we're not going to be able to heal this up. So third degree burns are very serious indeed. Um, there's no edema because the blood vessels have been destroyed. There's no pain because the nerve endings have been destroyed. So it's, but there's, um, but there's this problem of healing. So a large third degree burn will not heal spontaneously and skin, skin grafting will be necessary. Little plugs, cylindrical punches of skin will be removed from other regions of the body and then planted, like planting bulbs in a garden in the area of the third degree burn and the, and the cells will then begin to grow out from these from these plugs of, of healthy uh, epidermis and dermis. And eventually, if we put them close enough together, they can coalesce and, and cover the entire area of the third degree burn. So here's a picture of first degree burn where we have erythema and pain, second degree burn where we see blistering, and then third degree burn, full thickness burn, which may appear um, black or even white. Uh, and we can tell that there's all the tissue has been very severely destroyed here. And uh, the first step in treating um, these kinds of burns is debridement. That means removal of the dead tissue. Uh, dead tissue is good for nothing but colonization by bacteria, which will, will continue to, uh, to um, battle against our attempts to, to stimulate healing and, and so forth and recovery. So we need to get rid of the dead tissue. We need antibiotics. We've lost the ability to protect the, the body surface from microorganisms. And we need to put some kind of temporary, temporary covering to take the place of that barrier function. And again, we're going to need some skin grafts uh, to, to, to initiate the wound healing. Um, if too much of the skin surface area is damaged, uh, then we're going to have a very hard time uh, surviving that burn. This gives you a little sense of sort of a cutoff point uh, between um, likely to survive and less likely to survive uh, different kinds of burns, different types of burns. So you can see 25% doesn't sound like that much. 25% of second degree, degree burns is life threatening. So that's all we'll discuss. As I mentioned before, we each one of our chapters has some interesting um, um, supplemental information on, on developmental biology, and we will uh, let that be a subject you may want to canvas for yourself, but we will not discuss that in depth together. So this is the end of our discussion of Chapter 5 of the Skin. So join me next time. We'll be talking 